Today at DigTheDirt.com, we're going to bring you on a garden tour with Sustainable Eats. Hi, I'm Annette with Sustainable Eats, and I'm giving a tour today of my edible garden. It's a fifth of an acre here in Seattle, and we try to grow as much food as we can for our family of four on this piece of property. These are the booties we talked about, the old lady socks, um, the sandal socks, <laughs> the booties. <laughs> They're supposed to keep the coddling moth out the caterpillar that goes inside the fruit and then goes all around inside and just ruins the inside of your apple. These are uh, tulamine raspberries we just put in last year, but you can see they're totally loaded with raspberries. We'll have more than we know what to do with, even though we just put them all in last year. They fruit on the second year stocks, so the older stocks that are sort of brown wood are the ones after they fruit that I'm going to cut them to the ground. All this nice green growth is this year's brand new stocks, and so next year we'll get fruit off these. So it will be, there'll be half the plants in here in the fall that there are right now, essentially. It won't be so crowded. Somebody this year gave me an almond tree because it was in uh, soggy soil and it wasn't doing very well. So it, it spurred me to take out the parking strip. So it's an all-in-one almond. We'll see if we get anything out of it. But I have all this grow space now that I didn't used to have. I'm growing in coffee bags that are repurposed. So all of my sprawly big squashes are out here, things that don't need much soil, but they need a lot of space. So jack-o'-lanterns, the winter squashes, uh, watermelons, muskmelons, and potatoes. And then I also put some fruit trees in here, and I've got medicinals going, so borage, chamomile, echinacea, nasturtiums, and sunflowers. Uh, growing potatoes in coffee bags is if you have late variety potatoes that you need to hill. All you have to do is unroll the coffee bag more and add dirt. And then in the fall, you just dump the whole thing in the wheelbarrow so you're not forking through your potatoes and you don't miss digging up potatoes. It drains well in early spring, which is when a lot of potatoes rot. It's just a great way of growing potatoes, I think. Over here, I've got all the compact blueberries and cranberries and some lingonberries. And this was lawn. This is the second summer it hasn't been lawn anymore, but it's been limed for years and hard packed down because we always used to sled down it with the kids whenever it would snow. So what I did was I've been trying to amend the soil and get the pH right for blueberries for years. This year I got some coffee beans. You can go to any local coffee roaster and ask them if they have any beans, maybe that they had the wrong roast on or coffee grounds and amended the soil with them. The beans though are an amazing mulch that trap the soil most moisture in and all of a sudden my <laughs> blueberries are finally loaded. <laughs> the, the shrubs are finally loaded with berries as you can see. And the, that only works well because those are, those are 76 inch long pieces of metal and you can you know, store them in an upright tube in the winter, which is, I'm always looking for ways to store stuff. I don't have a barn. <laughs> but I literally just got some plastic and then these little clips are from the office supply store and they keep it on here pretty well. You can open it up, you can leave the ends open, you can slide it back during the day so that it doesn't get too hot in there should the sun decide to come out. But it's a great way to get beans out early, or uh, peppers out early, or tomatoes. I always start my tomatoes out. I put them out around April 15th. They started inside the house in February. So I start them earlier than normally you would, and then you get early tomatoes. <laughs> this is my the bed for my coal crops. And so I try to group the families together to make it easier to rotate all of the families. So I'm going to take the broccoli rob out as we eat it down and donate some to neighbors because I planted way too much. It's starting to shade the broccoli. Then the broccoli will be ready and we'll eat the broccoli or cut the sprouting broccoli off to make more room and sunlight for the Brussels sprouts. This is my carrot succession planting strategy. These carrots I planted out in early April on this side of the bed. So these will be ready in six weeks. We'll be eating all of these. They're sort of early varieties, uh, Purple Dragon and Scarlet Nantes. They do great, taste great, heirloom, full of nutrition. Then I just recently sowed the other half of the bed with carrot seeds, and those will be what we eat all fall. I'll take these out and store them in the refrigerator, which frees this space up in probably eight weeks, two months time to plant my winter carrots which will be all along here. So then all winter long, we'll just pull carrots out and eat them as we need them. You can store them in the ground in Seattle with no protection at all. Part of my challenge gardening is that I have small kids, and so I'm always trying to incorporate um, play features or areas where they can do things into the garden. And so we built this herb spiral this year. So if it was dry, um, they can water at the top, the water travels around the spiral, it ends up in a little mud pit. 
and then they make their own pies and bake them in the oven. This is actually a permaculture design, and the way it works is it's like a mini ecosystem. Things at the top are things that want the least amount of water. Things at the south and the west of the permaculture hill are things that want the most sun. Things that are at the north and the east want the least sun. Things that are at the bottom want the most water. So the stuff at the top dries out really quickly. I've got oregano and marjoram up there. And then I've got sage as you come around to get sunlight and thyme. And then parsley's in the back a little bit because it needs some sun, but it wants to bolt. Um, this is an Arctic kiwi. I was kind of surprised to find out that you could grow kiwi in Seattle. This is the Arctic type though. They cluster, they're like little grapes and you don't peel them, you eat them. They're sweet, but they're not the big fuzzy ones you get at the grocery store. The tractor that I mentioned before, we built out of two by twos. It's sized to fit inside all of my four by four beds, which I mentioned in the winter I grow green cover crops for um, soil reasons, also for chicken forage, so that they get some fresh greens in the winter when we don't want them to destroy the lawn. And um, I can also manage which beds they're going through in my garden by using this tractor versus just letting them have free rain and eat. I always have food growing year round, and so I don't want them just to have free access to it. Bees. Mason bees are native bees, and they come out earlier in the spring they're better pollinators than honeybees. They stick around, they don't fly very far. Honeybees will fly, I think, three miles away, whereas mason bees stick to basically a one or two yard area. So they're really hardy. They're, um, they've hatched out early fruit pollination when I need it for the fruit trees. And then they're filling up the little egg holes with eggs. When they're done, they mud them over. And then when this whole thing is full, then I'll take the little uh, larva larvas out and put them in the refrigerator until I need them next year. This is my favorite plant. It's called Lovage, L-O-V-A-G-E. The reason I love it is because the, the leaves have a really strong um, sort of licorice slash celery flavor. Celery is really hard to grow. It takes a long time and it, um, you never have it until sort of late summer when you need it. And then if you're making soup or a stew, it breaks down really quickly in super stew. So I use these leaves for the flavor. It's a perennial, it comes back really early, so by April I'll have this. But my favorite part about it is that all of these stalks are hollow. So each one of these you can cut off and use it as a drinking straw. So if you're drinking a, a tomato juice or a Bloody Mary, where you normally would have celery stock in there, you can actually drink through this and smell all of that celery flavor while you're drinking through it. Annette also has chickens in her backyard. She has three chickens back there that are housed up in a coop and she uses them for the eggs and to get rid of pill bugs around her garden. A great little tip that she gave us was to put golf balls where they lay their eggs so that they know where to lay them. Thanks so much to Annette for showing us her amazing vegetable garden in Seattle. To see more of her garden, go to sustainableeats.com, which is a blog that she runs there. If you'd like to give your own video garden tour, please contact us at digthedirt.com. We'd love to see it.